If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Hi, I'm Rachel Johnson and thanks for joining us on Common Ground. We travel the land of 10,000 lakes to bring you the best of the North Country's history, culture, and art. This week on Common Ground, learn about the history of Scorpion snowmobiles, formerly located in Crosby. Fans of this classic brand reunite each year to show off their vintage sleds at the Scorpion Homecoming Festival. Then photographer and world traveler Cal Rice takes us on a cultural journey through Cuba and Bhutan with his exhibit on display in Bemidji. Yeah, 2013 is the ninth year of Scorpion Homecoming. You know, it started as a bit of a dare to see if anybody would actually show up. But that, of course, is uh, a number of years ago now. And the first year was such a success we had a lot of people come, they had a lot of fun. Heard a lot of people in the town talking about the extra vehicles, staying at the hotels, eating at the diner, etc. And you realize that there's still a lot of interest uh, in these old machines and in the community that birthed them. I remember that first year we even went by the old plant and showed people where these machines previously had been made, you know, still right in Northwest Crosby. And every year we try to do something a little different. We feature a particular model from Scorpion and Trail Sled history, and we focus on that model for that particular year. Like today, we were focusing on the 1971 and 1972 wedge designs, and we had almost 30 of those machines. And to see the same machine, the same color scheme, same sparkling red, all in a line, it's it makes for quite a sight. People particularly enjoy to see that. Scorpion Homecoming is unique from most other vintage and antique snowmobile events. Most of those events integrate racing and a lot of other additional components that frankly lend to complication. What Scorpion Homecoming was from day one was simply Scorpion collectors getting together, not particularly pretentious, just enjoying one another's company and swapping stories and looking at one another's machines. The sled I have is the 1967 Scorpion 270 wide track. It is an original sled from one end to the other. It has not been restored whatsoever. I've owned it for four years. I found it in storage. In Wisconsin, it had been stored for a little over 30 years when I acquired it. Uh, I have been driving it now for four years, and it just runs beautiful. Uh, I have no intentions of restoring it now because it is in such great shape the way it is. It's, it's best just left as it is a piece of history, but I can still use it and enjoy it, so and we enjoy it. I, th I think my biggest attraction to them was the way they were built, the looks of the machine. I, I love the way they look. Um, also the fact that it was my first snowmobile that I bought. Um, I don't know why when I was 15 I wanted a Scorpion. I seen the Stinger which has the red metal flake hood and it was the first year and it really excited me and my dad tried to talk me into buying a cheaper model but I wasn't going to have any of it so I ended up getting the Stinger and uh, I still have it today, like I said, and it's not too many people can say that. Yeah, you know, the Cuyuna Range has seen good times and it's seen bad times. And in recent years, it's seen a lot of good times. We see what's happening with the Cuyuna Lakes 
in the mountain bike system, which is bringing a lot of renewed interest into town. A lot of outsiders are not familiar with Crosby, Ironton, or the surrounding areas that we affectionately call the Cuyuna Range. But as they also come to the, to the range, they're learning about the range's history. And this is something that I find so fascinating, particularly somewhat younger people. They don't even realize that there was once a top three snowmobile factory in the world right here in this beautiful little town of Crosby and Ironton. So I've been part of that awareness has been very rewarding. And it's literally a win-win for everybody. My name is Han Gyeol Kim. My name is Hyun Gyeong Lee. My name is Hong Nam Hee. Oh. Yeah. It's a Scorpion Traveler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because we are very far from here, uh, we came here uh, from very far from far from Korea. So we fly um, here about six thousand miles. So we want this hour. <laughs> Scorpion travel. Yeah. 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 Very oh, it's a little cold, and we're standing about ten degrees or, or ten uh, feet of water here. So let's keep this moving. Uh, in terms of sleds. We had 160 sleds this year, which is a good turnout, and our highest ever number of feature sleds, which was 28. So a big hand for everybody that brought those wedges out. Okay, and last but not least, it's the coveted Best of Feature Award. It's our last award, presented by this lovely young lady here in front of me. Isn't she doing a fine job today? Her name is Abby. I think she's related to me. Okay, this is a 71 Stinger 2. It takes it all from Elk River. Scott Tolf. Scott Tolf, come on down. We have a great time. Every time every time I come, I've come to the Scorpion Homecoming for, I think I missed the first couple that they had and I've been coming every year ever since. And uh, I, I just like coming to the Homecoming. I hope they can keep it going. You know, it's it's just, everybody there is interested in Scorpion snowmobiles. And that's, you know, what's really fun when you have, you know, that many people and that many sleds. I mean, anytime you can get, you know, 150 to 200 of one make, in one big place, it's that's quite an accomplishment, you know. And the, like I said, I compliment the chamber and everybody that puts this on every year because I think it's great. And it's it's just fun. You can come up. It's it's not real formal. I mean, but you go out, you you come, you do some riding, you do you know, you talk with everybody, and it's just it's a good time. It's a fun day, and I look forward to it every year. So, <laughs> in 2002. Myself and my family were introduced to the hobby of vintage and antique snowmobiling. We didn't even know what it was. My father and the other founders had gotten out of snowmobiling in 1969. It had been literally decades since we'd rode these machines, let alone seen these machines. We as a family didn't even own a Scorpion, not a single one. And when we walked into the Glenwood Ballroom in 2002 to see a vintage event that featured Scorpion snowmobiles, and we saw those beautifully restored and original snowmobiles up on that ballroom floor, we were shocked and literally brought to tears because the memories began to flow. And before I knew it, my father was on his knees next to a 64 looking at that old cleated track and remembering that configuration that he worked on for so many years. And here it was. And suddenly he was like a kid again. And I was like a kid again. And my family, we all felt the same way. And we met people that cared very deeply about the history of snowmobiling, but in particular, the history of Scorpion snowmobiles. And they began to ask my father questions, ask for his autograph. He began to realize how what he had birthed together with the other founders is now respected and in some quarters revered. And it was a wonderful thing to see a light in his eye 
that I hadn't seen for a number of years, and I thought that was a good thing. Well, what we have here is a little bit of trailer sled incorporated history, just right on this singular, singular wall. These are the founders of the firm. In 1959, three Crosby Ironton area men came together to form tra trailer sled, sorry, incorporated. Glenn Gutsman, my father Dick Harrison, and Eugene Stubb Harrison. This picture was taken in 1967 for Snowgoer Magazine. When they first came together in 59, they went headlong into the manufacture of something at that time was unprecedented, and that was a fiberglass skied air sled. And in 1959, there was no such thing as a snowmobile. Getting around in the wintertime was a big problem and was a real impediment to commerce. So when a machine like this came around, it was attractive to ranchers, the DNR, resort owners that needed to get fishermen on or out and back from the lake. And so these machines, which were called trailer sleds, because you could pull them behind a car, right but, but, uh, behind a tow coupling, uh, these would allow those commercial customers the ability to transport and move people like none other uh, that was, wasn't ever the case before. My name is Richard Harrison. I was one of the original founders of Trailer Sled, which was incorporated in 1959 and continued for around 10 years making air sleds and snowmobiles. Well, this is a 63. That's one of the first what we made. There was only several of those built. And we were, had originally built air sleds, and we started to get into this track-driven snowmobiles. And from there, it expanded for 10 years. Yeah, I worked on a lot of the first 65 fiberglass making molds, drawing pictures, designs, and so on and so forth. The air sled was pretty much my design that we worked on. So I guess we liked that curvy, round look. And of course, then these here, the production year went for several years that model did before it changed. The design was probably years ahead of its time, really, some of it was. I know the air sled was. It was nothing like that for a long, long time. Yeah, this is a uh, 67 uh, range whip that I converted from a fan engine to a free air. So I had redesigned the hood so that the cylinders uh, protruded through the hood for cooling, and it's a free air engine, and I modified the hood, made a new mold, made a new part for it, and redesigned the front end. So it's just a custom built sled is what it is. There's only two of these that I know. I made both of them. And it's uh, kind of an eye catcher and it looks nice. And we had the diamond cut heads on it so that it's, uh, it, it made a beautiful machine out of it. Uh, Scorpion made uh, several big advances and kept going and that's probably why they lasted as long as they did. So this particular building that we're in this evening was built specifically to display Scorpion snowmobiles as best as we reasonably can from the original prototypes all the way to the snowplow racers of the late 1970s. And I think for the most part we have a very accurate representation not just of the brand of Scorpion or Trailer Sled that birthed that brand, but a real view of the history of snowmobiling and the evolution of the sport from a utilitarian mode of transportation only to one of speed and thrill. And we, in the museum, basically lay out the machines chronologically. We have the early prototype from 1963 all the way up to 1980. And each year represents a bit of a change, not always dramatic, in some cases very dramatic as the machines change their, their track systems, their engine configurations, the way the engine was shaped, 
the skis, the width of the skis, all of those things changed dramatically as, as time went on. And what's kind of unique about this building is people can come here, stay as long as they like, and if they take the time, they will see the evolution of design, the evolution of technology, and the birthing literally of an entirely new industry whose story is uniquely Minnesota's. We have a Facebook page, which we link together with the Cuyuna Lakes Chamber of Commerce and work actively promoting our events uh, together. And people will learn all about the event, the agenda, and that's at trailasled.com, all one word, trailasled.com. And you'll also find in there facts, figures, trivia, information about various models, and also information regarding next year's homecoming in 2014. Hi, I'm Cal Rice. I'm a photographer in Bemidji. And at this point in my life, I enjoy traveling to different cultures and bringing back images to share with the people of northern Minnesota. This particular exhibit I called Cultures in Change. Culture to me is an interesting word. The definition that I'm using for what I'm doing here is culture is what we learn from the previous generation. So cultures are always in change but in some places they're in dynamic change. For example, in Bhutan, where 10 years ago, 15 years ago, for the first time in the history of the country, they got a road across the country, they got television, they got internet, and they got telephones. You can imagine how rapidly that is changing. First of all, let's talk about the country of Bhutan. Bhutan is a small country located high up in the Himalayas, a Buddhist country with people who are very peaceful, very friendly, and very easy to interact with. The primary crop they have is rice, a different rice than what we have here where we grow it in the water. They grow it on the mountainside. And here we see terraces going up the mountainside. Each terrace is two to six feet high with the river next to it, and they depend on the monsoon season to give them adequate moisture for the rice. The roads in Bhutan, actually there's one road that crosses the country, and somebody computed that one day we made a turn every nine seconds going across the country. But you get a feel for it here but many of the villages are still very isolated. Again, we see the terraces, and of course, always the mountains in the background. Going on over, this is a very important building, or actually set of buildings. It's called a zong, as spelled D-Z-O-N-G. These are the government buildings. This one happens to be in the capital. This is where the king has his office and the national officers. So we have our foreground here, our zong, the capital city in behind it, and then stretching on from there. The Tiger's Nest is the most famous monastery, the center of the history of Bhutan. In the 700s, Guru Rapochi flew into Bhutan on the back of a tiger and landed in a cave up here on the mountainside. He stayed there for several weeks meditating, and he was the one responsible for bringing Buddhism to Bhutan from Tibet. That was around 700. It took another 900 years before they decided to build a monastery in recognition of the event. Now, to get to the monastery, you can drive up to 8,300 feet. Then, depending on your choice, you can either walk or ride a horse for the next 1,000 feet up to about 9,400 feet, and then you hike up to around 10,500 feet. Unfortunately, about 15 years ago, the monastery burned down due to a kitchen fire, and they have totally rebuilt it. So all of this material has been hauled up the mountain to have it there for the monastery. Now, archery is the primary sport, the national sport of Bhutan. Anytime you see a group get together, there will be an archery contest. All you have to do is look around and someplace it's happening. They shoot at a target 
oh, maybe a little bigger than a large dinner plate. But that target is 150 yards away, one and a half football fields. And after they shoot their two arrows, they start walking to the other end while the next person's arrows go flying by them as they walk along. Construction is continually going on. I saw a place where a dump truck had dumped a load of rocks and they were splitting them by hand with a maul and a chisel. And then they pick them up like this and carry them to where the construction site is. Food in Bhutan is very simple. It consists of rice and peppers, three times a day, seven days a week. So you will find peppers drying everywhere you go. But it's, they seem to have a healthy diet of it, and occasionally they add chicken to the meal. Around the year 2000, they completed the first highway east and west across the country, which they call the National Highway. It doesn't actually reach clear to the borders, but this is the first time they've been able to travel across the country without going down to India, going across, and coming back up. The highway is about one and a half lanes wide, which means when you beat a vehicle, one of you goes off on the shoulder on that side, one goes off on the shoulder here, and usually one side is straight up and the other side is straight down. So it's an interesting ride as you go across the country. To me, of all the pictures that I have in this exhibit, the one that says how rapidly culture is changing is this one right here. We have the prayer wheel, which they have had for centuries. It actually has prayers written on paper inside of it. This dates back to the time uh, when people could not read or write, and so the prayers were written, they spin the wheel, and that sends the prayer out across the countryside. So this is in a tiny little village. Here's a little boy learning from his elders that you spin a prayer wheel. But then you look at him and you see his Crocs and his Lego truck. That's how fast things are changing in Bhutan right now. Before I went to Cuba, I talked to some people who had been there recently and I said, what picture do I want to get? And they said, architecture. This is a overview of Old Havana. I was up on a fifth uh, floor rooftop when I took this. The key feeling to get from here is that Cuba has not done any infrastructure work since 1960. And so you see a lot of building decay, water mains, uh, all of the infrastructure that you think about. A closer up shot of a building shows what I saw street after street, day after day in Havana. You see the roof is gone, the top floor is gone, but people continue to live on lower floors. So if there's a room that's enclosed, there's a family living there. But I think it would have been absolutely wonderful to have visited Cuba 75 years ago. This is one of the squares, there are four major squares in Havana, where they have restored the buildings. And just look at the architecture, the columns, the color that they would have had about 75 years ago. One of the pictures that I wanted before going to Cuba was the iconic picture of a Cuban smoking a Cuban cigar. I mean, what do you think of with Cuba if you don't think cigars? And so one day I got the opportunity, these men were just out on the sidewalk, and I was able to get what I think is a nice artistic picture, the close-up of the man with a cigar, and another one in the background. Before going to Cuba, I had the three pictures I wanted to get. The architecture, the Cuban cigar, and I wanted a picture of an American car with a Russian engine in it. This is a 1960 Buick, with a Russian tractor engine in it. Fortunately, I was able to get that about the second day in Havana, and that took the stress off of me as far as getting that picture. We had a model one day, and we were allowed five minutes each to photograph the model with an old car. This was my picture, which I really like, 
Artistically, she was sitting in the back seat. I adjusted the outside mirror to see her and then to see the inside of the car, which is a classic car. The taxis in Cuba are basically all American cars pre-1960. This is one I happen to see on the street. But if you see a newer car, it's a Russian car, and it probably belongs to a diplomat. So you see these kind of cars just on the street, traveling all the time. The cultural change to me is important. Maybe it's my age, but I think back to what did I learn from my parents versus what did my children and grandchildren learn from my generation. And if we don't document it, we lose that so quickly. We have lost information about our family, our grandparents. I can remember farming with horses and think how different that is today. And so I think it's important to maintain a history and to share that history of cultures, whether it be our own or in another country. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Common Ground, and we'll see you next week. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.